I'm going to open up your Bibles, Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 is where we're going to go ahead and start. And if you want to go ahead and stand up, we'll read the passage and honor God's word. We'll stand and read, and then we'll pray, and then we'll get into the message here. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, the Bible reads, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this rain that you give us today. It is a blessing. And God, we just pray for the message today that you'd use your word to help us to grow and to labor for you. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. So Jesus was talking here in this passage to his disciples. And you know, we had 12 disciples, and I don't think that we have many more than 12 people here today. And so, you know, Jesus obviously used 12 to do a great and mighty work and change the world and to preach the kingdom. And and the Bible says in verse 35 that he went to all the cities and and all the villages and and he healed every sickness and every disease. And, you know, Jesus wants us to go into all the cities and all the villages and he wants us to preach the gospel to everybody. And the gospel can heal every sickness and every, every disease. And if I had a, a title for the message today, since Wes will probably throw it up on YouTube and, and, and title it, the message would be the laborers are few. The Bible says in verse 37, Jesus says, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And I, I want to talk about us laboring for the Lord because we do have a new pastor coming in and one of the things he's definitely going to expect of us and that we, God expects of us is that we'll labor for the Lord and that we'll labor um, in seeing people reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I think that's the best way that we can really encourage our young pastor is by being laborers for him. And we have a lot of great laborers in the church, and I'm just excited to see what God's going to do. But in order for us to labor for the Lord, there's a few things that we've got to do to be ready to labor for the Lord. Uh, of course, there's stories about like the maniac at Gadara, and, and he wanted to go with Christ and, and immediately teach. And you know, Christ told him, you know, to stay there and tell him what great things that the Lord hath done for thee. And you know, our testimony be, ought to be one of the things that you know we have and that we share with people um, that we can tell them. And of course, the woman at the well, you know, she went and told everybody about the, the Messiah and that you know he had told uh, her everything that she ever did. And so she went and had that testimony to people. Um, and, and so we, we have those stories about people going out and laboring and telling, um, uh, uh, telling people about what the Lord has done for them. But God wants us to do a few things as well as to be prepared to labor for him, to be a skilled laborer. And uh, the first thing that we need to do is that we need a purpose that we're going to work for the Lord, that we're going to labor for the Lord. And so... To purpose, you know, the Bible talks about Daniel that he purposed in his heart that he wouldn't defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, and you know we really need to to purpose. I mean, we need to basically say that you know this is where we stand. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to purpose in my heart that I am going to serve the Lord, and and that really should be something that we just make up in our mind that we're going to do. Wes and I were talking earlier about definitions. I do have some definitions in this sermon. And you can go to the dictionary and look it up. But, you know, one of the definitions for purpose is it says that you have reached a decision. You know, that it gives the example, he purposed never to drink again. But, you know, we ought to just come to the decision that we're going to labor for the Lord, that we're going to tell people about Jesus Christ. It also gives this other one. It says that it, it, it is another is to have a plan or a objective. So not only is purpose having a, like made a decision, but it's also having a plan or objective. And so we need a purpose in our heart. We need to have a plan. And I know Brother Haley's got a plan. He, I know they go out Thursday nights and Saturday nights um, and that, that that's their plan. And he's going to have a plan. We need to get on board with that, what that plan and objective is. And then also we need to labor in the reading of God's word and we need to have a plan our objective about reading the Bible. And so if you don't have a Bible plan, I can share one with you or you can check it off. 
Um, and, you know, I like to read some of the Old Testament and New Testament at the same time because the New Testament refers back to the Old Testament and the Old Testament foreshadows the New Testament. So I think it's great, you know, to be able to reference them both at the same time. But we need to have a plan for our, our Bible reading. We need to have a plan for soul winning. We need to have a, you know, a plan that we go through with people and, you know, based off of, you know, their questions and stuff, we'll have a plan. Um, Tondra, she got saved last Sunday and literally it was, you know, she came in and she wanted to get baptized and it was like, what doth hinder me to be baptized? I mean, straight out of Acts chapter 8. So, you know, I took her to Acts chapter 8, you know, with the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip and he said, you know, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And, you know, of course, you know, Philip preached it to him Jesus Christ and I did the same thing and you know if thou believest with all thine with all thine heart thou mayest and she got baptized last Sunday and so you know that's a blessing but we need to know we need to be ready we need to have a plan and we need to know if people come up and say you know what must I do to be saved or what doth hinder me to be baptized that we can actually show them from the Bible what doth hinder them to be baptized and you know that's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and so she got saved and she got baptized you know there's nothing after that that hindered her to be baptized so we baptized her and you know for Pastor Haley I mean like his first service there I mean he got to baptize I mean so the, the church is laboring already and that's got to be a huge encouragement to him and that's really the way that we can be the best encouragement to him is by laboring all right also the Bible talks about, go ahead and turn to uh, Proverbs chapter 16. If you want to keep your finger there, we'll refer back to it. Um, there's one other verse I'm going to share in Proverbs. But we talked about, we're talking about purposing. We're talking about coming to a decision to do something. And we're also talking about having a plan to do something. So if we come to this decision, then we also need to have a plan for it. Proverbs 16 verse 3 it says this, it says, Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. So, you know, you think, well, you know, what am I going to do? Uh, you know, I don't necessarily have a plan. Well, the Bible says if you just commit that to the Lord, that he'll, he'll establish your thoughts. He'll help you come up with a plan as to what you need to do. The Bible, or the Bible, the dictionary actually defines commit. It says this, it says, Use entirely for a specific person, activity, or cause. So basically what the Bible is saying is here, you're committing, you're using entirely your works for the Lord. You know, and that's really where it should be because everything else that we do is a vain in our life. We need to commit our works unto the Lord. We need to use them entirely for Him. But th there's also another definition. It says that you, that you put your trust upon that. And, and, you know, I think that's awesome. You know, I mean, we should trust in the Lord with all our heart, you know, and lean not onto our own understanding. And then we're going to commit our works unto the Lord, and He'll give us that plan. He'll establish our thoughts. And so after we've purposed, after we've come to this decision, you know, we need to prepare to labor. Go ahead and turn in the Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 5. So we've purposed in our heart, and we want to do it. And I think a lot of people, you know, they want to, but maybe they don't know how. And, and we're going to talk about preparing so the second point is prepare yourself to labor. You know, if you're going to labor skillfully, you know, Wes is an architect. I mean, he had to go to school for, what, seven, six years to five years? You know? I had to go for five. I went for eight. So, you know, it takes a lot of time, a lot of preparation to be a skilled laborer. Um, you know, the Bible talks about people that are unskillful in the word that they need milk. And... You know, there is a time in a Christian's life where you do need the milk. I mean, you know, uh, Caleb, he needs the milk right now. He can't handle the meat. But, you know, we ought to be a church that is skillful in the word, that our preacher can actually teach us the meat of the word. You know, and, you know, Jesus said, you know, my meat is to do the will of the Father. And so we need to be able to handle meat. But the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 7, actually in 17, excuse me, 1 Timothy 5, 17, it says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. And I just want to say right now that it's a lot of hard work to read your Bible. And it is, the Bible says that it's a labor, to labor in the word of doctrine. I don't know about you, but every time I try to read the Bible, like at night, I fall asleep. I mean, it's hard work. And so... We need to be ones that labor in the word and doctrine. And it says, you know, for the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the labor is worthy of his reward. And, you know, we have a pastor, and we ought to do everything that we can so that he is able to labor in the word and doctrine. And I know that's our plan, and that ultimately we want to get there. But, you know, laboring in the word and doctrine is a lot of hard work. 
And you know, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, I'll just read it for you here real quick as it comes to mind. Um, it talks about like reading and how, how exhausting reading can be in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And uh, I like this verse, if I can find it here. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, it says this. It says, um, uh, it says, and further by these, this is, Sol or this is Solomon uh, preaching here. It says in Ecclesiastes 12, 12, it says, And further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books, there is no such end. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. It is exhausting and it's laborious to get up here and prepare a message. You know, Wes had texted me yesterday to see if I would be able to do it. And, you know, I was already tired, but I knew, like, I was going to have to wake up really early this morning to get that done. And, you know, Wes, you know, talked about, you know, three, four hours, you know, to prepare a message, and we're not even that skillful in it, you know. And, uh, you know, Brother Haley and Brother Houston spend a lot more time than that, you know, preparing in the Word and doctrine. And so we need to be prepared by reading our Bible. And, you know, preparation means that you make ready in advance. And so you need to know what's coming, and you need to make yourself ready in advance. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, 7, you don't have to turn there. You just write it down. It says, prepare thy work without and make it fit for thyself in the field, and afterwards build thine house. And so, you know, what it's saying is, like, you need to have a plan before you go out there in the field. And the Bible talks about that field being, you know, the harvest of souls. And so we need to have that plan and have that preparation um, that we're ready to go out and lead people to Christ in that field and afterwards build thine house. It's funny that it also says build thine house because the Bible talks about the house of God, you know, being the church. And so I think this actually applies to that, talking about that labor, labor and the harvest, that, hey, you're going to go out here into the field, which is wide into harvest, and afterwards, you know, you're going to build that house, you know, build the house of God by doing that. And, yeah, you know, we'd all agree that we would love to see this house built, you know, and and so that's what I think, Brother Haley. I think that's why he's here. You know, he wants to build the house of God, the God, the house, the church that God builds. You know, because all we can do is go out and labor in that field, and then whatever God, you know, He's the one that plants people in the church. All right, Ephesians chapter six. We can go ahead and turn there. Um, Ephesians chapter six, verse fourteen. Ephesians chapter 6. So we're talking about preparation, you know, being prepared. You know, one of the things um, we say at work is um, that the separation is in the preparation, you know. And so, you know, what makes us a great business is that we have the ability to prepare to handle anything, you know. And we want to be so rock solid that we're prepared for anything, that nothing's going to break us down, okay. And so the separation is in the preparation. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 14, it says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. And, you know, the Bible talks about holding forth the word of truth, okay? So we have that word of truth. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. See, it, it says have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You need to have the gospel prepared in your heart and ready to give it at any moment. And so, you know, obviously it uses the feet because we're supposed to go, you therefore we're supposed to go out. And then we have to have that preparation. You know, the, the Bible says that the preparation of the heart and man and the answer of the tongue is of the Lord. See, God will help you prepare. It says the preparations of the heart and man and the answer of the tongue is, is from the Lord. He will give you what you need to say. He will give you those. The Holy Spirit will call to remembrance those verses that you need. And so he can't do that if you don't have the preparations in your heart. And if you don't have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So we have purposed to labor for the Lord. We are prepared to labor for the Lord. After that, you know, we, we're doing that so that we can be productive laborers for the Lord. You know, nobody wants to hire somebody and then have them not be productive. And, you know, God, you know, rewards us based off of our productivity. You know, he, he doesn't just reward everybody the same. Um, the, the Bible says that he shall, you know, reward us according to our, our works. And so, uh, you know, obviously salvation is by grace through faith and it's a gift of God, not of works. And there's no works involved in being saved. But after we're saved, we're saved unto good works and God will reward us. He'll be a debtor to no, to no man and he will reward us to, for our works and how productive we are. Turn in, in the Bible to John chapter 4. This one kind of reminds me of the original passage that we're in. This is right after the, the story with the woman of the well in John chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 35 through 38. So this is very similar to Matthew chapter 9. It says in verse 
35, we'll, we'll start in 34, it says, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye there are four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already unto harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages. See, there's God, you know, giving us wages there and rewarding us for our works. And gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that re reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is, is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon you bestowed no labor, other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. I think it's awesome, you know, that it talks about, you know, us working as a team and us laboring together. And, uh, you know, I, I think it, it's great that one sows, another reapeth. When the Bible talks about sowing, what it's talking about, the, there's a parable of the sower. What does the sower sow? The sower sows the word. And so, you know, I think about Diarana. I mean, she's out there right now, like, giving out tracts to, like, everybody. Everywhere she goes, she's sowing the word of God. And then, you know, you know, I had an opportunity to be the reaper, you know, and she brought somebody to church. She sowed the word in Tondra's heart. And then, you know, I came through and I reaped. And, you know, Dairon and I forever will reap fruit unto life eternal and be able to rejoice forever about that. You know, and that's a pretty awesome thought, you know. And that's what God's doing is you might be the sower. You might, you know, Glenda, you might be out just giving tracks to people. But then somebody like me or Brother Haley might come behind and reap on that. But we both have reward for that. And we both get to rejoice forever about that. And... Uh, you, you know, it, it says that we're working on things that other people have already labored, you know. So there's people praying for people, and they might not ever see, you know, the fruit of their labor until they get to heaven. But, you know, we can go out and reap that, and, and you know, in heaven we'll know that, hey, you know, I, I helped reap what somebody else was sowing. And that's just an awesome thought to think, you know, God, you know, has set up and has you know, guided us to people that, you know, other people have been praying and working for and that we can, you know, help lead to the Lord. You know, the Bible says that the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he that wins souls is wise. Uh, and, you know, we ought to be excited about laboring and being productive Christians. You know, the Bible, want, you know, God wants us to be productive and to bring forth fruit. In Ecclesiastes 4, 9, it says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. And, you know, that's one of the reasons we go out two by two is because if one falls, the other one's there to pick them up. And, you know, it talks about, hey, you have a good reward. It doesn't just say reward. It says a good reward. And I trust God that he's able to reward us better than we're able to reward ourselves. You know, there's been a lot of things in my life that I thought that I wanted that I thought would be a great reward that, you know, ultimately I realized that God didn't give them to me because I, I, it wouldn't have been a good reward for him. And the things that he's given me are actually good rewards. And so, you know, I trust him to do that. And I, I think it's great that, you know, we can labor together. And I'm just excited about that. That's one of the things I'm most excited about is um, us laboring together for the Lord. Turn your Bibles to 1 Peter, and we'll be in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. And so if we're going to labor for the Lord, we need a purpose in our heart to do that. We need to be prepared for labor by laboring in the Word. We need to get in the Word and read that. All right, First Peter. Okay. Might be Second Peter. Or maybe I am in Second Peter. <laughs> That's what it is. All right, First Peter, chapter one. Verse 23 is where we're going to be. All right, it says in here, it says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You know, we talked about, uh, you know, sowing, and that's what, what the Bible was talking about in John. It was talking about sowing, the ones that sow and the ones that reap. And the Bible says here that seed that we're sowing is the incorruptible word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And it says, For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word 
which by the gospel is preached unto you. And so it's very important to understand that the gospel is preached through the word of God. The Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so, you know, we have to have that preparation. We have to have that preparation in the word of God because the word of God is the seed. The sower soweth the word and the word of God is the incorruptible seed. Uh, which is by which we're born again. And so that's very important for us to understand. And so we want to be productive. We need to have the right seed, and we need to sow that seed, and we also need to reap that harvest. And then also we need to pray. You know, the last, I got all the alliteration going on here. Last thing we need to do, in order for us to be productive, we really need to pray. We can't do this in our own strength. You know, I, I've talk to a lot of people and you know the fear of like going out and like soul winning I don't think it ever goes away you know God had to tell Jeremiah not to be afraid of their faces of course he was like a kid I think when he had said that to Jeremiah but still uh, you know the apostles they all had to pay, pray for boldness and you know if the apostle Paul had to pray for boldness I think that he I mean he had to pray for boldness because I think he was scared why else would you need boldness and so um, you know it's kind of scary sometimes I guess in our flesh you know we we let that uh, deter us and so we need to pray for boldness so in Acts chapter 4 verse 7 the Bible says uh, this is the story about the lame man that was healed at the gate beautiful and you know they said silver and gold have I none um, you know but in, in the name of uh, Jesus you know stand up and walk and I, I probably butcher that I probably could have just gone back to the and quoted it and it says here let's see faith Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And so that's where we're at. You know, all these Pharisees are all upset about all these miracles and people believing on Jesus Christ because it's, you know, hurting their, their business. And it says, and when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power, by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. So if we're going to do this, you know, we need to pray to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And if we this day be examined of this, the good deed done to this impotent man by what means he has made whole be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom ye crucified whom God raised from the dead even by him doth this man stand here before you whole this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders which has become the head of the corner and I love this verse it says neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so, you know, we need to be bold in letting people know that there is no other name under heaven. It's not Buddha and it's not Allah. Jesus Christ is the only name under heaven whereby we must be saved. And that takes boldness to be able to tell people that. And it says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, see, this, they're seeing the boldness because they're getting up there and they're telling it like it is, and perceived that they, they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them and that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. And so if we're bold and we're praying for boldness and we're telling the truth, nobody can say anything against what we're saying because it's true. And if you go down to verse 29, it says, and now, Lord, they're, they're going to pray here, right? Because they're praying for boldness because all these people are, you know, uh, against them and persecuting them. And it says in verse 29, it says, and now, Lord, behold, they're threatening. So they're being threatened. And here's another thing. If you do take a stand for Jesus, people are going to threaten you. They are going to say stuff against you. They're going to revile you and persecute you. It's just a part of the deal, and you should rejoice and leap for joy. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness, see, they're praying for boldness, that we may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. And so I want you to see there that, you know, being filled with the Holy Ghost actually means that you're going to speak the word of God with boldness. And so, you know, if you're not speaking the word of God very much in your life, you know, the Bible talks about them that feared the name of the Lord and spoke often, you know, on, on his word in Malachi. I mean, if you're going to be filled with the Holy Ghost, part of being filled with the Holy Ghost is actually speaking the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed and was his own, but they had all things common, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. And so, you know, I pray that 
you know, we would all be together in one accord like this, that we'd be filled with the Holy Ghost, you know, that we would be given great grace and, and, and power um, upon us all. You know, it says that all that believed, that that's what happened. And so that's, you know, what I'm hoping for. That's what I'm praying for. Um, and, and I think that's what God ultimately wants to do. And we'll finish here in Philippians chapter 2. Go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 2. So right now we've purposed in our heart that we're going to labor for the Lord because we, we know Brother Haley is a worker. You know, w that's one of the things that we like about him and that's one of the things that you know it's been the testimony of him from other people is that he is a really hard worker and so we need to just purpose right now that we're going to labor along with him and we also need to be prepared to labor that we're going to need to get skillful in the word of god that we're going to need to prepare our hearts um, and to be ready to give an answer and then also we want to be productive and that that means by you know being that fruit of the righteous is the tree of life and he that winneth souls is wise we need to be productive in that manner and if we're going to be productive we need to pray for boldness and we're going to finish here in philippians chapter 2 verse 16 and it says holding forth the word of life that i may rejoice in the day of christ that i have not run in vain neither labored in vain and so you know you see there it talks again about laboring and part of that labor is holding forth the word of life and that's talking about you know sharing the gospel and the bible with people and that that is a labor it's hard work yea and if i be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith i joy and rejoice with you all for the same cause also do you joy and rejoice with me but i trust in the lord jesus to send timotheus shortly unto you that i also may be of good comfort when i know your state for I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For I have, uh, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. And so I think we're really blessed right now to have Timothy sent to us. I mean, I feel like God has sent us our Timothy right here in Philippians chapter 2. That he is going to, he's like-minded like us. I mean, we all, we agree on doctrine. Uh, we're like-minded and then he's going to seek those things which are Jesus Christ. He's going to lead us in that way. And I do feel like God has sent us a young Timothy. And so I think that is awesome and I'm excited about it. And I think it's a blessing. And I'm just excited to see what this church is going to do. Um, and, and we're going to do those things which aren't our own but are Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father.